I'll be honest with you. I was never a big fan of Baldur's Gate. And to anyone who knows me, this should not come as a surprise. I'm pretty sure I never miss an opportunity to point out how many issues I have with that game and the setting of Faerun and the Sword Coast itself. But this is not where I bash a setting that's been around longer than I have and that has been loved by more people than I will ever meet in my life or be loved by. There's no reason for me to do this other than to contextualize what you just saw. In December of 1999, the CRPG Planescape Torment was released on PC. It received stellar reviews, but sold only decently well and was no commercial success. Many attributed it to being a more mature, serious game that catered to a smaller audience. And they were not wrong. Planescape Torment told the story of a man who was cursed with eternal life, yet not with immortality. Each time he lost his life, his memories would be cleansed and he would find himself lost and confused, no recollection of who he was or where he had come from. Over time his body would scar so badly that barely any surface of his skin remained untouched and he would live countless lives, lives of sin and of virtue, lives of war and peace, of paranoid delusions and compassionate selflessness. Each life would grow from its kernel and form its own personality, its own ambitions and goals, and its own understandings of its existence. But ultimately, they would all die, and a new life would take their place. Until this one death, after which the mind would no longer forget, and that is where the game begins. The game of Planescape Torment is a game of philosophy, of choices, of facing the ghosts of your past, and of forging a new path ahead. Can you find a way to die? To end the cycle of death and life that would capture countless souls in the vortex of your karmic destiny? Could you break free? The Nameless One would journey through Sigil, the City of Doors, the domain of the Lady of Pain, where he would meet new and old acquaintances. He would travel to the prison plane of Carcery, the fiendish war zone of Bator, and even the negative material plane and beyond, cut off from the rest of existence. The game is not about fighting against increasingly challenging monsters to earn levels and expand your repertoire of spells and skills. It is not about saving the world from wicked beings hell-bent on its destruction, or defeating an army sweeping across the lands. It is a game about one man and the misery his choices have caused and his journey to undo the damage he has done in the hopes that he may die a final time. And it is about a question, a question whose answer will forever elude us. What can change the nature of a man? Planescape did not begin with Torment, of course. No, rather it was created during the second edition era of Dungeons and Dragons in 1994, at the time known as Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, designed by Zeb Cook and an expansion upon the base idea of the Great Wheel cosmology as proposed by Jeff Grubb in 1987. When you mention Planescape, most who are familiar with the setting will think of Sigil. That's Sigil, with a hard G by the way, Burke, but Sigil is but a small fraction of this campaign setting. Indeed, it spans all the planes of the multiverse, from the inner planes of the elements to the outer planes of alignments. Unlike the other campaign settings of Dungeons and Dragons, who generally focus on the prime material plane, where the worlds of Toril, Kryn, and such exist, Planescape instead presents the option of living and adventuring as a planar being, a traveler familiar with the greater cosmology of the Dungeons and Dragons setting. Naturally, this opens up the possibility to encounter many of the previous settings deities and planar beings in their natural elements, and Planescape also offers the possibility to play as so-called plane-touched creatures, descendants of unions between these planar beings and mortal lovers. The tieflings, by now a common race among players of Dungeons and Dragons, were actually introduced in Planescape as exactly this, humanoids whose ancestry had fiendish blood intermingled in them. Likewise, the Asimar, whose planar descendants is from celestial beings, and Genasi or Genasi, partly elementals, originated in this setting. The planes, which had been mentioned before in the setting, were greatly expanded upon during the production of Planescape, and the outer planes especially saw great development. As TSR, who owned the IP at the time, were unwilling to risk another outrage from them using words such as demons or devils, yet wanted to keep these elements in their game, the outer planes of the Abyss and Bator, homes of chaotic evil and lawful evil fiends respectively, were further developed and their denizens were renamed as Tanari and Batesu. 
Of course, many more planes were further explored, such as the twin paradise of Bytopia, the happy hunting grounds of the Beastlands, and the grey wastes of Hades. Each of these planes are home to native creatures, but also the souls of petitioners, mortals from the prime material plane whose faith and lives determine where they are to manifest upon their death. A lawful good paladin may find himself appearing on the plain of Mount Celestia where he will serve his deity in the afterlife, while a wicked and cruel blackguard may instead find herself reincarnated as a lowly larva of the abyss, although able to ascend and become a fiend herself should she have the fortitude and strength of will to ascend the rank of demons. Indeed, some of the petitioners to these planes will be transformed into creatures native to these planes, and even some of the greatest evils of the Abyss or Bator have once actually been mortals on material planes, yet twisted into grotesque monstrosities over time as their wickedness allowed them to gain power in the afterlife. Although interestingly, the memories of these petitioners would be lost to them, kept instead in the astral plane upon their death. Thus, even vile Orcus was once a mortal, and while the demon lord has no memories of his previous life, it would theoretically be possible to speak to his memories which are kept forever in the astral plane. In Sigil, the city is governed somewhat by the factions. Of course, ultimately Sigil belongs to the Lady of Pain, but she would not involve herself with the daily affairs unless someone breaks the cardinal rules of her city, upsetting the balance. Deities are not permitted entrance into her city, only their worshippers, and any who attempt to elevate her to the level of godhood, to worship her as a divinity, will find themselves flayed alive as an example made unto others. Those who break her rules or challenge her rulership will either die swiftly or be spirited away into small demi-planes called mazes, each created to uniquely challenge the imprisoned individual. These labyrinths would be almost but not entirely impossible to escape, although very, very few have ever achieved such a daring escape. The factions, meanwhile, are groups of mortals who banded together under unique philosophical creeds. As the planes in many ways are ruled by belief, these factions surmised that should their belief become dominant, the planes would adjust themselves accordingly. These beliefs range from nihilistic pursuits of the perfect death to mastery of the body and the mind, or even the desire to experience as much of the planar multiverse as possible in one lifetime. The factions serve both as guilds for those who wish to study their ways, as well as administrative bodies handling the daily affairs of Sigil. The mercy killers, who believe in blind justice above all else, rule over Sigil's prisons, their staunch belief in a merciless world making them the perfect jailers, while the fated who believe the creed of might makes right are the custodians of the Hall of Records and serve as the city's tax collectors. As for the city itself, Sigil is altogether unique, shaped like a torus, that is to say like a donut, and floating high atop an infinitely tall pillar of rock in the middle of the outlands, the neutral landscape of the plains that connected all the outer plains, the city covers the entire inside of the torus. The hole in the middle of the donut is open, thus allowing for one to fall out of the city, should one wish to do so, or alternatively dispose of a body quickly, but as no one has yet to survive jumping out of Sigil, or at least hasn't returned to speak of it, it is assumed that something in the murky, misty emptiness out there prevents access. If this is hard for you to visualize, I do not blame you. It is a city like no others, after all. Sigil is also called the City of Doors, a nickname given to it due to the countless gateways to other planes, including the material ones that can be found there. Some are conventional doorways, well known and traversed, while others could be the still surface of a well or the metal hoop of a broken barrel. Some of them remain open at all times, while others will only allow passage if one carries a white rose in one's lapel or hums a specific song or even recalls a specific memory on a certain day of the year. Many, many creatures will ultimately end up in Sigil by accident. These unfortunates are called clueless, or primes should they be from the prime material plane, and are often objects of ridicule or even exploitation by the citizens of Sigil. To any knight of Eberron or monster slayer of Ravenloft, arriving in Sigil would undoubtedly provide an intense shock due to the presence of creatures of all manner living in relative harmony. 
Of course, as anything disrupting the status quo of the City of Doors is strongly forbidden, those beings who would fall upon each other in any other situation can be found there, living side by side, sometimes even sharing an ale at the Smoldering Corpse Bar, or discussing deep philosophical issues at the brothel for slaking intellectual lusts. Fiends and Celestials would engage in friendly competitions, perhaps even enjoying the brief time away from their conflicts, and races of all kinds and creeds would live, work, and play together. Of course, conflicts would arise, as Sigil is far from a safe haven for anyone, and those who assumed that the Lady of Pain's laws guaranteed safety would rarely survive for long. Street gangs, faction arguments, and minor religious conflicts between followers of opposing deities are commonplace in Sigil, tolerated by the Lady of Pain and her servants up until a point where it would disturb trade and the daily lives of its citizens. Espionage and sabotage would occur often, and many factions would have specific recruiters out there looking for newly arrived clueless to indoctrinate and bolster their ranks with. Likewise, the buying and selling of souls would not be uncommon in Sigil, as the traders of souls, common among the fiends of the plains, especially appreciate the opportunity to conduct their business more openly than the narrow-minded worlds of the material planes could offer. Should one be looking for magical artifacts, knowledge assumed long lost, or even passage and guidance to one of the planes, Sigil would be the best place to look for it. For a price, of course. But unlike many of the prime worlds, morality and decency is generally far more flexible in the City of Doors than anywhere else. Suffice to say, Planescape and Sigil offers a significantly different take on the classic formula of fantasy roleplaying, and while it has not seen much attention since 3.5, it has more than earned its place in the history of Dungeons and Dragons with how it evolved and developed the planes that still form the basis of much of D&D's cosmology. I hope to provide more information about this setting in a series of video essays on it, released alongside my regular videos, and if you found this interesting or enjoyable, I hope you'll stick around to watch some more. This will probably be the first time I say this, but if you made it this far, don't forget to click that like and subscribe button, as that helps me immensely in creating more videos explaining the lore and history of the content you love. Thank you so much for watching, and huge props to Idrin who has served as the expert consultant on this video, and who will be helping me fact check future videos on Planescape and its settings.